Nigeria's four government-controlled oil refineries with a cumulative capacity of about 445,000 barrels per day have been moribund for decades. Thus, Nigeria exports its oil in crude form and imports refined oil with scarce foreign exchange. According to Crude Oil Refineries Owners Association of Nigeria, Koran, modular, modular refineries should be encouraged because it can eliminate the cost of transportation of the crude abroad, the cost of bringing them back, and the cost of middlemen who make money from selling these products. Joining us now to discuss the need for government to encourage the availability of locally refined fuels at competitive pricing is Momo Oyarekwa, Chairman of Crude Oil Refineries Owners Association of Nigeria, Koran. Good morning and welcome to the morning show. Yeah, good morning. Mr. Oyarekwa, yeah. many Nigerians don't think that the refineries that we say have been moribund for decades will never come alive. Many Nigerians have given up. Oh, I've given up hope. Can you make a case for these modular refineries? Because the Nigerian government previously had said under President Buhari that, look, they're going to integrate these modular refineries. What is the argument for these modular refineries? And where are we with modular refineries in Nigeria at this moment? And what can they contribute? OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruben. I think to start with, uh, the modular refineries, the government realized their importance. That's the reason they were actually, it actually came on board that, okay, we should establish modular refineries. And I think uh, at this time, we probably have about 40 or so that have been licensed from the level of uh, LTE to uh, the level of uh, LTO. So uh, having said that, Modular refineries are not uh, are meant to actually be at the well head, you know. So the importance of that is that as you produce crude from the well head, there is a process plant. And this process plant just take uh, the crude, process it, and you can bring it to market. And uh, modular refineries are not meant to be offshore. So they are meant to be on land, land feeds. So all of the marginal feeds you have on the land today and all of that, if you establish modular refinery close to them, depend on the capacity and all of that, they will ref you will refine those crude and bring them straight into the market. So the importance here is that if you have several modular refineries, let's assume we have 40 licenses today, and each of these refineries produces an average of 10,000 barrels of crude, what you're going to have is 400,000 barrels of crude being processed into the country. So all of these challenges that we're talking about today of availability of products and all of that would have been solved. So what we are saying in Koran is that let government stimulate the modular refineries and all of that. All of that. Let there be intervention. Let there be funds that uh, modular refineries can even access, just like you have funds, uh, intervention funds for gas today so that products will be available in the market. Like she has rightly said when she was introducing this uh, program, you're going to eliminate several costs. Cost of taking crude abroad, bringing it back, cost of clearing at the terminal, cost of port charges, cost of the middlemen that are involved, even foreign traders that bring this product to Lome, where we go to, we buy at Lome, ship it back to Nigeria, they make their profit and all of that. Who pay all of this? The Nigeria people, today we're complaining of subsidy, we're talking of subsidy, we're talking of petrol being too high. Why is the cost so high? If we produce this, uh, if we produce petrol in Nigeria today, all of these costs will be eliminated. So what you have is a cheaper petrol for the masses to consume, for everybody who has a car to consume. Thank you. All right, okay, so that's why your case, which has been made a number of times for uh, modular refineries and supporting it. There have been some challenges that have been identified. I mean, one of such is even the relationship with the regulators, NNPC and NMPDRA, um, and some of the issues around access to the feedstock, access to foreign exchange, um, um, high renewal um, fees for refineries. How can we address these issues? And this is a platform and opportunity for you to share with us. What is the current state of the relationship with NNPC, for instance? Have they been supportive of modular refineries and the, their owners and the running in Nigeria? Uh, so far, uh, what I would say is that 
I wouldn't completely say they've not been supportive. I mean, giving us the room to have conversation with them. For me, I would say, I'll call it support. Uh, but for some of us that have actually installed our refinery, we, our expectation was that we we're going to get supplies from NNPC to be able to buy crude from them and all of that. We have been engaging, but that has not yielded us any fruit. To this moment, I mean, for our own refinery, it's been on stream for about two years now. We would have expected that by now we would have been able to buy crude from NNPC. That hasn't been the case. Uh, we have gone back and forth, back and forth, and all of that. We are still where we are. We have not really seen any shift from the position where we are. Uh, like you have mentioned, you have spoken about uh, the currency issue, yeah, foreign, foreign, exchange. foreign exchange, and all of that. We have uh, advocated that modular refineries need to be, uh, crude need to be sold to modular refineries in Naira. Because, I mean, when you process this uh, product, you're going to sell in Naira. We're selling into Nigeria market. So our income is in Naira. So the, the feedstock should also be in Naira so that we don't come and overcrowd the foreign exchange market. Because let's assume, I have just uh, mentioned that if you have 40 modular refineries of 10,000 capacity, for example, and you have to go into the market to look for equivalent USD to pay for the crude, you imagine, for a 10,000 barrel refinery, for example, that we have, if the average price of crude is $100, just to make it very simple, we are going to require minimum of three of $30,000 on a monthly, uh, $30 million on a monthly basis to procure crude. So what you're going to have is that in a month, uh, sorry, in a year, we're going to require about $360 million. So imagine you have 10, uh, 10 refineries of 10,000 barrels each, that's going to be how much? $3.6 billion that you will require to pay for crude. So for me, I think it's going to mount pressure on the foreign exchange and it's going to drive the foreign exchange up. So the right thing to do, the sense in it, is to sell crude in local currency to modular refinery and ensure that the product goes into the local market. If for any reason, any modular refinery actually export any aspect of their crude, then they should pay for that aspect of the crude in US dollars. So this is our position, and this is the position we hold and we have been engaging. Okay, I mean, you've said a lot, you run a modular refinery, 40 licenses given, but only about three or four or five are operational as we speak. Uh, you have the biggest modular refinery in the country. The first question will be, why is it that we don't get a lot of petrol being produced by modular refineries? It's mostly diesel and heavy oil, you know, to the market. And secondly, uh, we've, we've talked about how we can jumpstart modular refineries. You've talked about the problem of feedstock. But another very important problem that we have constantly as we speak today is support and distribution channels. The fact that how easy it is for us to get optics into the market distribution channels and support. Can you talk through that? And how can we ensure that those 40 licenses given out, at least they can, some of them can start working? Because if they get support, a lot of them want to start working. But it takes a lot to be able to set up these modular refineries. Okay, thank you, uh, Rufai. I mean, these are actually very simple things to do. Uh, let me start with, maybe I take them one by one. Uh, the refineries, why, why we don't have PMS, it's always uh, very expensive to add to most modular refineries. Or let me break it down from the beginning. Every modular refinery you see today, from the licenses you have, I think we currently have about uh, five who tend to be operational, but four that I can confirm at the moment, uh, which is uh, OPAC, which is ours. Then you have the Watersmith refinery, which is about 5,000 barrel, I think, and the uh, NDP Arrow refinery um, also have installed, I think I heard this about 11,000 now, so I'm not, I'm not very sure. And you have the Edo refinery. Uh, I think Dupo is meant to be coming on stream too. I don't know how far they have gone. Uh, the last I heard was that they were doing some form of test run. Um, so to make these refineries produce uh, PMS, because they, we all currently produce 
naphtha, we produce fuel oil, we produce uh, diesel, we produce kerosene. And the naphtha, naphtha is feedstock for PMS, but you need to add a reformer. So the reformer now breaks that down to PMS. Uh, the reformer is actually very expensive. How much is An it? average refine, uh, reformer, it's in the window of about $100 million. You know, and for some of us, we have put a lot of investment. These are private equity funds that we have deployed into these refineries. To raise another $100 million, it's, it's not a child's play. I mean, it, takes us, it took us a lot to be able to even attract the equity people who are involved in our refinery in the first place, given the circumstance of Nigeria, even given some of the challenges we are facing today, even crude supply and all of that. Imagine for a refinery you have installed, you are not even getting crude fee stock and all of that, then you're going to a bank to raise $100 million for a reformer, or you're perhaps going to individuals or company, corporate investors and all of that to request for additional money, you, I mean, you know what the answer will be. So what we have said is that there should be some kind of intervention fund. In CBN, we have applied as a company to CBN to assess the development funds, even to add, uh, what do you call it, uh, a reformer. We did this in 2021. Till this moment, we have not even res had a response from CBN to, to, to say, okay, we are supporting you guys, we're giving you this so loan the government and all of that. And make the fund available to give four of you guys ref, uh, reformers so that in such a way that you can reform and give petrol. Exactly. This is exactly what we're saying. We're saying let there be intervention fund. Let there be some kind of funds that we can assess. Even with the CBN or the, it could be uh, perhaps the development funds. And even those people who are currently, some people have done their feed and they are ready to install their refinery. They are also looking at assessing some form of funds. That's what we're saying that funds should be created, like the gas funds, because we are talking of alternative source of energy. You are not going to very, very soon uh, leave the fossil fuel. We still require the fossil fuel. We're going to live with the fossil fuel for the next 20 years. Or 50. Or so. So we still require refineries to break down okay. some of this. Uh, so, so what you're saying is that, yeah. just to, because I was talking the line of support. Mm. If we can get reformers mm. to these four different, yours, you are doing 10,000 barrels. Yeah, we're doing 10,000. Another one is doing 11,000 barrels, another one is doing 5,000 barrels. Yeah. If we can get reformers for all of you and feed stock, how much liters of fuel can they, millions of liters of fuel can they, can you guys produce? Okay, at, at 10,000 barrels, I can speak of our own. At 10,000 barrels, we'll probably be able to produce about, on a monthly basis, we'll probably be able to produce about 14, uh, 14 million liters of, uh, of PMS, and we pull that into the country. Okay, I get this. Modular refineries, operators, you want more support yes. from government. That's clear. But why should government support modular refineries when we already have in the pipeline, already on the, on the ground, the Dangote refineries that will do 650,000 you know, uh, barrels per day, and even more uh, when you look at the entire range of production that can come from there. And two, how about this issue of crude oil theft? What do you think of it? Because uh, supporting modular refineries, are, you going, are we not going to have a, a bigger redo of producing more oil thieves who will be empowered to steal Nigerian uh, resources? And then those Four refineries that are moribund. What do you think the Nigerian government should do about them? Very brief answers. Okay, quickly. Uh, to start with, uh, the Dangote refinery is a different ball game on its own. I mean, from we are where, talking about supply. Yeah, from where it's located and all of that, it's not close to feedstock, so it has to ship feedstock. Is in Lagos and all of that. Like I've said, modular refineries are close to well head. You produce and you take care of your catchment area. For example, we are in Delta right now. So all of the products we are producing, everybody around Delta, Edo, uh, Anambra, and all of those areas come and quickly take it. So they save the cost of transport, of traveling all the way to Lagos to come and load product. Because if you pay more on transport, what you're doing, you're adding more to the cost of the product. So the closer it is to your market, 
the better it is. Then when it comes to about uh, the oil thieves, people breaking pipelines and all of that, in fact, modular refinery are strategically uh, positioned to also solve this problem. For example, where we are, you have the Focados and the Brass pipeline. So if all the producers there are ready to give us crude, you don't need to pass crude through the pipeline. All we do, we just refine the product and it goes into the market. So you find all the money you are spending on security and all of that. Do modular we, refineries produce petrol? We can produce petrol, as I have analyzed. I mean, reformers. it's re about having the reformers supporting the modular refineries and all of that. So even the money that are being spent on security to protect the pipelines in our catchment and clusters will be saved. Because you just, all you need to do, for example, we are uh, located by pillar right now, even the small quantity we're using to run our refinery, about 1,500, is pillar that is giving, us to, giving it to us. We just have a 400 meter pipeline into pillar facility. So they produce about 5,000. If they give us all of that quantity, you will not have issues of theft, of saying, oh, this product is going to pass through pipeline, someone is going to break it when it's going to focados or something. So modular refineries can also solve this problem. Can they also solve the problem of the moribund refineries? No, okay, the moribund refineries, like you have said, you know, I mean, as an engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer by training also. So if you think about it, you have to assess the condition of those refineries to know whether you, you actually needed to put more money or not. Because if, an, uh, if equipment is uh, obsolete and all of that, you are still trying to revamp it when you know you cannot revamp, it will work for a while, but it's going to break down again. So whether it's really necessary, that's another discussion on its own. All right, let me yeah. tap into that discussion a little. Is it necessary? Because the NNPC chairman, um, MD, GMD, has said that in, um, over the next few years, 2024, 2025, and 2026, the reform refineries will begin to work. Is this an investment worth going into? Or perhaps we should shelve that, focus on you know, the Dangote refinery, focus on the modular refineries, building up the recommendations you've made, or perhaps what you're asking the government in terms of support, focus on that rather than pumping money in, pumping into these refineries. What's your take on that? Like I've just said, I mean, you see an equipment, if equipment is obsolete, I don't know if they are obsolete, but if they are obsolete and you keep forcing them, it's, it isn't as if they are not going to work, but they're going to break down again. That's the issue we have had with these refineries. They work and break down, they work and break down, and all of that. So they are not sustainable. But I mean, if private, for me, I would have even said that government should remove their hand totally. If they have to sell the refinery, let them sell it. Because if private people run businesses, what you're going to get is that they will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. For example, I would, if not for the crude issues that I'm having in my refinery, I'm not going to leave my refinery not working. It's cost-benefit. You have to look at it. I mean, if your, your shareholders are expecting you to pay returns and all of that. You won't sit at home and be watching that your refinery is not working and all of that. You have to find solutions. It's not the same with government. The bureaucracy of government, of having to make decisions and all of that. I mean, it's not the same thing with private sector. Private sector, they know they have to make money to run. I mean, government are, are charging tariffs and all of that, levies and all of that, which you're paying. For example, in our refinery today, one of the issues I actually want to mention right now is some of the cost that the regulators are also putting on us. For example, for every liter of uh, product that we produce today, we have to pay about five naira 80 kobo, like a tow, from the refinery before the products are evacuated. We have one naira evacuation charge, which has to be paid to NMDPRA. We have an um, off-takers charge, one naira. We have 0.5% of our OSA price that has to be paid. There is a recent one that was just introduced, uh, midstream, downstream gas infrastructure charge, 0 0.5 of our OSA cost. All of this come to 5 naira 80 kobo. We're talking of bringing the price of these products down. Why should we pay five naira eighty kobo upfront? You have to pay it upfront, just like a toll. So, and this will make the product more expensive. So, we are speaking. We are saying, look, let's interact. Let's have a platform with government. Let's look at what the issues are. The issues are not issues that are not surmountable. We can work with government. I mean, business exists to solve problems. Business exists to work with government so that challenges that the people face can be solved. So businesses are solution providers. So, and this is where the modular refinery comes into this. 
we are not just speaking for modular refinery owner. We are also speaking for the conventional refinery owner. Because even Dangote, though I know he's in a free trade zone and all of that, I don't know if these charges will be applicable to him. But he has to pay this charge. If Dangote produce PMS today, he has to pay five naira eighty kobo on each liter of fuel that comes into the market. Is that not making it more expensive? So all of these things are the things we're talking about that we should interface and find a way to find a solution to and make products that will be sold into the Nigeria market cheaper for the Nigeria let, man to consume. Let, let's talk about availability of stock. You said, okay, one, you get from Pillar, but that's not enough. Also, I know there's new cross around, you know, where your refinery uh, is. You know, how can we really crack this problem of availability of feed stock? which is one of the biggest problems. Because I feel very sad hearing that you have a modular refinery, the equipment is there, but because there's no feedstock, it's a problem. Yeah, you see, <laughs> thank you for that question. You see, in our cluster today, in fact, when we went into why we choose the cluster where we are today, is that we realized that there was a production of about, uh, minimum of about 30,000 barrels to 40,000 barrels that is produced in that cluster. So our refinery was meant to be upgraded over time to about 60,000 barrels per day so that we can take the product coming from that cluster. So you don't need to export it because when you export product, you're actually taking it to a refinery abroad and all of that. So why export it when you can actually uh, solve it? So luckily enough, <clears throat> in the PIA, there is the domestic crude obligation. So it's not meant for government to enforce that. NUPROC and all of that to enforce, to ensure What's that this What's the threshold of the domestic crude obligation? Uh, I mean, I cannot say because I don't have the law off and but what I'm saying is that with the domestic crude obligation, government need to come to play and say, okay, you have a refinery here. Why thinking of selling this product to a shell or to Ajip? You take it through Focado's line or brass when there is a modular refinery. Give this modular refinery the quantity they require. If NNPC cannot sell to us, in fact, our strategy with NNPC on this was exactly what I'm describing. Ours was that, okay, if NNPC could sell 10,000 barrels to us, we swap it with any of the cluster members. So because NNPC has equity crude in um, Focados, they also have equity crude in, um, in Brass. So when you sell to us, even if we can't take it at that location, what we do is we swap it with a pillar. For example, we share a common fence with pillar. So we swap it with Pillar, we take all of their 5,000 barrels. So it's uh, accounted for to them on the, on the other side. So all of this can be emulated in several locations and all of that. And I'm sure if some of these people who have licenses, if they now begin to see that we are being supported, we that are already on stream, that will even push them to, to, I mean, put more effort to bring their refineries on stream or to continue with the construction. Because even if they go to bank today, what are the banks going to say to them? The banks are going to tell them that, look, some refineries are running. They don't even have crude and all of that. You want us to fund you. How are we going to fund you? How are we going to get our monies back? Okay. So these are some of the challenges. Okay, we've been talking about modular refineries, yeah. right? You talked about cost. You refer to a five naira. 80 cobalt cost. But what exactly does it cost to produce a liter of, say, kerosene or diesel from a modular refinery? And then secondly, there are, in other countries, refineries that have been 100 years old. In Nigeria, we don't have a refinery that is over 100 years old. But those refineries, we say they are moribund. What do we think is wrong? And what can we do? to get those other refineries working. Because they can also provide a better economy of scale. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, like I have said already, uh, I always think that the government does not have, uh, does not, shouldn't be in business, you know? Government should play the role of regulation. Regulate the industry, regulate it properly. Allow private sectors to run their business. If you go to most parts of the world, most of the refineries you find there, they are owned by the private sector. Government might have equity, maybe 10% equity also, but you allow people who are professionals in running this thing. Like I have said, in every business, shareholders, stakeholders, and all of that, investors, they are waiting to reap their investment. So you cannot run a business and be telling the business 
or telling your shareholders, telling your investors that you will not be able to run properly. So first and foremost, for me, privatizing our refineries, if that becomes the eventuality, should be one way to go. You know, sorry, your second question. I, I How much does it cost to produce a liter? Yeah, for, that's another advantage of modular refinery. Today, our cost, running cost, producing one liter of, in fact, to run on a daily basis. So it will cost, a, it cost us about $3 to produce equivalent of $3 to refine one barrel of crude. So which is very man, in, minimal. The cost of running modular refineries are also far less than the cost of running conventional refineries. You know, so in this area too, you save cost. And you know, for every cost you put into your production, you will pass it to the consumer. So when costs are reduced- We're the long suffering consumers of Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the less the cost of your production, the better for your consumer. Okay. So these are some of the areas. <laughs> right. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Amamo uh, Oyakera for joining us on the morning show. Making a case for modular refineries. Yeah. I hope the uh, relevant stakeholders are listening to you.